Hey everybody. So I've been digging into Pixie Studio for a few months now, trying to find out the best tips and tricks that I can pass on to you guys. I've done many videos on the overall process of importing, the tessellation, optimization, LOD generation, exporting, and this video is really more about a few of the tips that I've learned that I don't think are obvious uh, at the start. So the first is this, tip one, is if you launch Pixie Studio and you are not getting any type of feedback when clicking on the, the window itself, except for perhaps like a, a chime or a ping, then what is likely happened is that the initial document that pops up in front of this or the initial window to explain the import process is likely open and on another screen. That happens to me often uh, on a four screen setup that I'm on. If that happens to you and you can't find the screen, the best tip here is to click in your 3D viewer and hit Alt F4 and it will kill the window that's open on another screen that you don't see. It's a very rare occurrence, but it's something that I've found to be frustrating if I'm trying to just get in work and I'm not getting a response from the window itself. Um, once you've hit the Alt F4 button once, then you're able to get in here and use it as intended because that window is no longer taking priority over your inputs. Awesome. Tip two is if you are trying to run a bunch of files into Pixies, let's say you have 10 different files, the first six of them all come in here. You can run a script that you've created down here in the window. Everything is great. You pull in your seventh one. And for some reason, Pixie Studio hangs. It says that there's an error. It just stops. Instead of panicking or thinking that it just will not work, try this step first before moving on and just calling it good for now. And that is coming up to the top and going to edit preferences. IO, and then inside of import, we have an option here to prefer alternative importers. This is basically a different type of import uh, that you're able to try that operates in a different capacity to the standard preferred importer. So I've seen in over 60%, I would say, of the cases where I have an issue with importing the file because it was either created in a certain type of software or a different version, um, or it has something unique within the 3D data itself or the naming convention, I found that turning this on will generally pull that file in. Uh, if it doesn't, then let me know. Reach out to me and I will happily help you through your, your file that you're having an issue with. Um, but give this a try first. The only thing that you want to make sure is that after you import this file, though, that you come back into this option and uncheck it because then it's going to be attempting to use the alternative importer uh, instead of your primary and it can create some issues over the long term if the next three models that you have out of your 10 uh, all just can use the standard importer so there's tip two for tip three let's go back into the preferences and io tab and this is a tip for if you're wanting to get the most compression and maintaining the highest fidelity out of your files when you are trying to export specifically for GLTF is that there is a export GLTF Draco compression uh, node here that you can tab on or off. I have mine turned on. The only issue with that is that once something has been compressed with Draco compression, Anything that's a bit more legacy or is not expecting a Draco compression 3D object is not going to read it well. However, this gets you the absolute most compression that you can get into a 3D object using GLB, GLTF, etc. Um, so give this a try if you feel like you're still just not getting quite the compression that you're hoping for with your GLTF and, uh, and see if that doesn't work for you. If you intend to stay within the Pixies pipeline or you want to come back into the model and continue iterating on it, I wouldn't check this just so that you can get in here and not have any potential software uh, kickbacks on what's going to want to be viewing Draco compression and what's not. But give it a try, see what happens, and uh, let me know what your results are there. For tip four, 
Um, really, this is all about the visualization tab in that I've seen many folks uh, not quite leverage it. So let's go into our handy dandy radial engine. And I'm just going to do a quick tessellate just so that we see 3D data. Now, one thing that I wanna show here is that in the visualization tab, you have settings and you have lighting and environment. So get over here and you can change all types of information. So I can change the transparency for what I'm looking at. I can change the way that I'm generally looking at something. Uh, for this to behave like a Maya or a Blender, I have constrained up axis turned on. If you want it to behave more like a Katia or a an engineering piece of hardware or software rather, uh, you could take that off, et cetera. Um, you can also come in here and see different lighting conditions by rotating the maps. You can change out what the environment map is so that the lighting changes a bit. Uh, this especially comes into play when you've started to assign materials, but get in here and, uh, and give this a try. It really helps with visualizing what you're looking at. Um, while we're in here as a uh, kind of tip for 4.5, I guess, um, leverage these tools as well. So you've got your measurement tools, selection tools. Um, so selection can let you pick things that will stay within the bounding box. You can change how this, how this works exactly. Um, cutting plane I use often. So here we can actually go forward and backwards and start to look at intersections of what we have. Exploded view is always a helpful thing from an engineering perspective, just to see what components are perhaps hiding within others. Um, so that's always really helpful for visualization. And lastly, you have your UV projection tool, which I use all the time. So you can turn that on and create UVs with that tool. All right, so that's tip four. The last tip is just a process that I hadn't really realized was a thing until I got deeper into the software and started getting needing the most compression out of the projects that I was working. Um, so this is within Optimize Mesh, a process called Phantom Mesh. And once I click on that, um, you can get in here and essentially command whatever you have selected to more or less, I would summarize this as like shrink wrapping the mesh. So it spits out one piece of geometry. Everything is merged. It's all uh, optimized and decimated down and it kind of removes all of the gunk from the inside of your files and just gives you the best uh, envelope, if you will, of what you're looking at. So running the phantom mesh is really helpful. Um, and I guess I'll say uh, a, a tip five and a half here is always check out your sample scripts. So if I go into sample scripts down here, I can actually see that there is one in here called process generate phantom mesh. So if I want to see an approximation of what the phantom mesh process is doing, I can drag this file into here, start to poke around and see exactly what it's doing. So if we drag this up and kind of analyze what this code is saying, the phantom mesh process will, you can choose if you want to bake a diffuse map or not. It will go to root, it will repair CAD, tessellate, repair mesh, merge final, delete patches, delete lines. If you've selected to bake diffuse, it will then bake it for you. Decimate the mesh, hidden removal, which means anything that we cannot see from the exterior is going to be removed. And then take the result of what you've done here and merge all of the parts. Then down here we have the actual execution if you're baking to fuse. Two of the last tips that I'll give for tip six and tip seven uh, is inside of this help menu, you have a lot of good stuff. So documentation, uh, again, that can also take you into the sample scripts directory, go to the Pixies, GitLab, et cetera. But remember that this API reference is always here. So if you want to open that up from within here, you can see everything that you can get into from a, 
API perspective. And a lot of this I eventually use for, let's just type in something like decimate. And uh, like this here, since I can search for the word decimate, I can understand that this is a function that I can uh, deploy on one of my recipes or within one of my recipes. And it also explains within the code what each of these is going to, to do. So you have occurrences, distance for surfacic tolerance, distic for Linnaic tolerance, and then you have normal tolerance, texture coordinate tolerance, and then a Boolean. So that helps to really understand and contextualize what you're doing when you start getting into writing the code down here. And that brings up our last tip of everything in this GUI, for the most part, you can get into the Python code on the back end of what's happening. So let's say I really like the decimate to quality. I want to apply this to this specific part. I want to use the low preset, but maybe I want to customize surfacic tolerance to let's say 0.1. And now it's something that's a bit bespoke. I've figured out that this is exactly what I like. And now I can copy this Python code to the clipboard. And if I'm making a new script down here, I can paste that. And now it knows what it needs to go in and uh, put for me down here within the scripting window. And you can do that over and over again. So anything within here that you want to get into and get the Python code, you can copy that to your clipboard, bring it down into your scripting window and start to see what that looks like. And this is going to help a ton when you start getting more into scenario processor and the automation of this. So you can process a hundred files when you go home for the weekend, instead of needing each one to come in and be manually processed. So those are the tips. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great day. Please like, comment, and subscribe. See y'all in the next one.